Great, great. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC309, our class, a course on urban church planting. Thank you for connecting to the class today. Let's take a moment just to pray, and then we will get started. I just request somebody to um, please lead us in prayer, and then we will start. Who would like to lead us in prayer? Pastor, shall I pray? Go ahead, Prabhakar. Please do that. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you, we acknowledge your holy name at this moment. We come unto your throne of praise, Father. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity that you are leading us into this hour of class, Father. Bless Pastor Ashish and all the students here. Father, lead us and guide us and teach us the way you want us to be uh, in the near future, Father. Thank you so much. Uh, I dedicate all the time and all the members unto your mighty hand. Bless us. Bless each and everyone. Thank you. I ask this prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, everyone. Once again, thanks for connecting to this class. We are talking about urban church planting. And uh, last week, we covered ground on uh, about the seven mountains. Uh, or seven spheres, I mean, uh, seven spheres, seven areas in society that we can mobilize people to impact. Uh, the, and then we moved into the next chapter, which is we started talking about stages of growth and development. That is, as you pioneer a work, as you are planning a church or a Christian ministry, um, that work uh, is going to go through stages of growth. It's going to grow over time. And, um, and so we need to understand, we need to understand, you know, what are those stages of growth? And then in each stage, uh, we need to, uh, let's say, uh, do certain things. So we need to be mindful of how we are building. You know, so I, and I think a good example, a good analogy, uh, would be the construction of you know a big building, and uh, and that's a good analogy to keep in mind, where um, uh, you initially lay the foundation, uh, and so you go through that stage of foundation laying, and then you have the the structure coming up and. And the structure comes up, uh, it, you know, and if you're building several floors, you build floor by floor. Uh, then after the structure comes up, then all the other things begin to take place in that structure uh, until that building is completely finished. Now, that's a good analogy because uh, in First Corinthians chapter 3, when the Apostle Paul is talking about his work as a pioneer, as a, a church planter, as an apostle, he uses the same analogy. He says, you know, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and somebody else builds on it, but let every person take heed how he builds on it. So he's saying, you know, to put it in simple English, Paul is saying, look, uh, God has given me the grace to lay the foundation and then somebody else builds on that foundation, but let every person, you know, comes and builds, let him be careful how he builds on it. Right, so he's using that same analogy to talk about church planting, to talk about pioneering the apostolic work. He talks about he uses the same analogy. So, uh, with that in mind, let's quickly uh, uh, review uh, what we we started talking last week, and then we will move forward. So we we mentioned the pioneering state. We were we were discussing this, or I was just sharing some thoughts here. That you know, as you plant the church uh, in a city urban center you'd look you can look at the early year sometimes two years sometimes four years you know that early stage as your pioneering stage you are laying a foundation and uh, from there you're going to build now in the foundation stage you are you know of course you're digging down you're going down 
uh, it's not very impressive you know it's a whole lot messy and dirty and because you're digging into the ground you're pulling out earth and then you're putting in all the uh, the the rocks and you're doing all of that so it's not you know people are not seeing big things happen uh, it's all going underground uh, but and whatever you do think about this right whatever you do in the foundation may remain or not may but will remain unseen and nobody's going to come and clap their hands and say wow you got a strong foundation no it's all hidden it's all it's all covered you know after you lay the foundation so in other words the pioneering stage is not something that's going to be celebrated in time to come people are not going to remember it many times they forget but that foundation stage is so important for everything else that happens in the future. Even though it's not going to be recognized in the future. People are, you know, nobody's people are not even going to know how deep you went. People are not even going to know, you know, what all you put in the foundation. No, it's all hidden under the ground. They only see the building that comes up on it. But it's the foundation that's going to last for the entire lifetime of the building. It's going to last for the entire lifetime of what you, what of, of whatever that work is going to be. So it is so important, and yet it is so unrec. It will go unrecognized. People are going to forget, and it's not going to be spoken about often in in time to come. But it is so important for everything that happens in the future. So, understanding the importance of that pioneering stage, that foundation laying stage, is so important. So, the motivation must be I must lay a good foundation. And this is what the future is going to be built on the foundation I lay. Now, you know, when, you, when you're talking about spiritual things, I'm, sh you know, I'm, uh, God, you know, it's, it's not entirely the way it works in the natural because. In the spiritual, God can you know re-establish the foundation, which in the natural you you can't do it. You have to tear everything down and pull it up again. But in the spiritual, God can. You know, uh, in a local church, sometimes uh, God does that. You know, in 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 a community, in a church body, that can happen. But essentially, the foundation, your motive, our motivation is: I want to lay a good foundation. You want to establish things. So some of the things that we did, we did during the foundation stage, and I'm just sharing this with you. One which I, I, I talked about last time was uh, whatever we do now, the way we conduct ourselves now is the way we're going to be conducting ourselves in time to come. Now, take it, what I, I would say is, understand it correctly it's not applicable to everything but essentially you know and I, and I gave the example of how from the very beginning we uh, we we worked with the idea that we're not going to go and visit people everywhere in their homes but people will come and meet us in the office as pastors and we would spend time you know we would spend time with them as required uh, so we we established that in the beginning People understood it, and that's how we continue to work even today, right? And it it's, it it enables us to serve more people that way. So some other things that we had to establish in the pioneering stage, I'm just sharing about our own journey. Is from the very beginning we decided that we are the church, that everything we do will be geared towards ultimately discipling people. And therefore, are, we are not. We, you know, we will have evangelism. We will have outreach, but we are going to equip people, disciple, and equip believers. We're going to stay with that. We, uh, 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 why was that important? Because uh, it, you know, the, the, there were a lot of ideas, and there still are many ideas in the church. Uh, you know, uh, they okay. Make your service very attractive to seekers. You know, they used to be the seeker sensitive, or seeker friendly services. Uh, 
um, there used to be services that uh, that people used to have where you know uh, make the message very simple and light so that you know just anybody will come in and they'll understand okay so th there were all these different options but we said no we're going to teach the word we're going to you know, emphasize discipling and equipping believers so that they can do the work of the ministry. So that was a decision we made from the very beginning. This is the way the church is going to work. It's going to be emphasizing the ministry, the word and the work of the spirit, the word and the spirit, so that believers can be equipped for the ministry. So from the very beginning, we did that. Now, so uh, other things we put in place was Things like uh, emphasis on missions. That means we need to be serving people beyond ourselves. We need to be evangelizing and we need to be doing missions. The missions, we're going beyond our city, going into other parts of the country, and then looking beyond our own country, uh, uh, looking into the other nations. So missions was something from the very beginning uh, was part of what we were doing. Right. So even though we were a small church, a small group, just in the pioneering stage, missions was part of our, our thinking, our understanding that we need to be involved in it. So from our, I think our second, third year, I think from our second year, 2002, we, we, we started you know, doing, going on missions and so on and so forth and encouraging people to do that. So, so these are things that, that you lay in the foundation because this is what you want the church to grow into. You want, you know, this is the building. The building is, uh, this is what the building will look like based upon the foundation, right? And in the foundation time that you're establishing your commitment to that place that you're called to serve, called to minister, okay? So this pioneering stage is very important. And then, from an organizational side, we'll get into it, but you also need to establish certain things like uh, excellence, you want to do things well, and so on. And that kind of leads us into the next stage. But let me pause here and see if there are any questions here as far as the pioneering stage is concerned about urban church planting. Any questions on that? Any thoughts on that? Everybody's okay with that. Any questions? Say, you have a question, please go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, what's the frequency of prayer at the beginning? Um, is it always more? And as we progress, lessons, or we maintain it, or we keep increasing it? Uh, what's the frequency of prayer at the initial stage? And then how do we continue there on? Mm. 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 Very good, very good question. Um, so generally speaking, see, uh, there is no set formula, uh, you know, for how much prayer, how much word, uh, how much things you do. There's no set formula. And I think each one should pursue what, what God's called us to do. But, uh having said that we must understand prayer is a very important part of the whole process and we need to maintain it throughout our journey so uh, you know acts chapter 6 the uh, uh, uh sorry acts 5 acts 5 the apostles said you know sorry, Acts 6, the apostle said, you know, we must give ourselves continually to the ministry of the word and prayer. So they understood the importance of both, the ministry of the word and prayer. And so you do whatever you, I will share with you what we did, but I'm just speaking in general terms now. Um, each one should do, you know, what, what they feel called to do, you know, the ministry of the word and prayer. Now, you know, when you observe ministries, when you observe churches, you find, you know, some churches are more are stronger in prayer. They, so the emphasis is more on the prayer side. Some may be more strong in the word, so the emphasis will be more on that. So you have all kinds of examples that we can observe. But I want to say one thing. Just keep this in mind. 
prayer will not do what the word of God can do. And the word of God will not do what prayer can do. In other words, uh, try to un let's understand this together. Uh, in other words, prayer has its place. The word of God has its place. I cannot do in prayer what God has given the word of God to do in my life. And I cannot do through the word what prayer is supposed to do in my life. Meaning both these are very important as an individual and as a church community. right? So I cannot substitute prayer with the word. I cannot substitute the word with prayer. Both are important. So, so we have to discover what, what, how does God want us to do it. Now, um, for us at APC, when we started, we used to have Friday evening prayer. So we started with that. You know, and and uh, one of the challenges we had was we didn't have our own place. Uh, if we had our own place, I, you know, I probably would have had uh, you know prayer every day or something like that. You know, do, do, done much more in prayer. But we, you know, we were having we had to rent our places where we would meet. So we would rent this place. Uh, uh, yeah, I think from the early days, yeah. Uh, after we moved out of the house uh, to a meeting place, uh, we started renting a place for Friday evening prayer. So we would have Friday evening to us prayer. We would do that. And the Sunday morning would be the service. Um, then we introduced, uh, we, we did different things in our journey. Uh, when, the spot, when it was possible and we had a place to do, we did all night prayer, once a month, all night prayer. So that would go from uh, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. So we do that. Uh, we would do evenings of prayer. So sometimes it would be two, three hours on the evenings. Uh, so we, we did that. And then what worked for us, uh, what we were following uh, before the pandemic was uh, twice a year we had five days of prayer. That was kind of the last format that was good for us so uh, we had uh, five days of prayer twice a year and then every sunday morning we introduced for for most of our locations we introduced prayer before the service so we had pre-service prayer 8 to 8 30 every sunday which which we still do um, in four of our locations because there people can come at eight o'clock and they spend the first 30 minutes in prayer and uh, we decided to do it on Sunday mornings because everybody's together and so on. So we've tried, uh, uh, you know, to see what would work best for us as a church community where people can participate. Uh, some of the challenges we've had to deal with is we didn't have, we still don't have our own place. So we always rent the venues um, and people have to drive through traffic. So um, uh, we, we said, let's do, Whenever people gather together, we will do that. So Sunday mornings, they come together, so we do morning prayer and so on. But at a personal level, I try to maintain. So as a leader, I need to maintain a strong prayer life. So on a weekly basis, so I would take time off to pray. Sometimes, you know, usually it's my Fridays. Uh, I would keep that day aside for prayer, preparation, so on. So I try to keep a day aside for prayer. Uh, at, at a personal level. Of course, you, know, you pray throughout the week, but to pray extended hours, usually it's on Fridays I spend the day in prayer. Uh, most Fridays would be like that. So that's at a personal level. And then at a, at a corporate level, we have different, you know, different, uh, uh, we've tried different variations. Um, I hope I answered your question. I addressed your question. I was just sharing what we did. Yeah. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Pastor. Thank you. All right. So the pioneering stage is very important. Um, Christopher, go ahead. Oh, yes, Pastor. I just uh, uh, wanted to understand a little bit about, you know, in the pioneering stage. Um, and you mentioned a couple of times about, you know, not having your own place. Um, when um, you know churches in general um, are started off, um, is there um, uh, you know what uh, a motivation to have their own their their own place uh, versus not not having their own place, and how that sort of you know progresses over the over the years, um, and um, 
maybe you could just you know give us some of the uh, pros and cons of you know of that uh, and uh, uh, you know, from 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 a sort of a, I'm mean, just to share, maybe just uh, you know, from a sort of a secular standpoint, you know, when when people look at uh, you know, make a decision about you know, having their own place versus versus renting, uh, you know, they kind of feel that sometimes uh, you know, they are uh, you know, giving uh, the rent uh, rental amount to the landlord, which could be you know, which could really uh, you know, sort of um, be used to, uh, uh, you know, uh, pay for the for the for the, um, for the for the mortgage or whatever you know mm -hmm. whatever they need to uh, pay for the for the place or over mm -hmm. over over, over a number of years. Mm -hmm. And um, I am aware that you know there are some there are some churches which sort of you know drive that point quite aggressively, hmm. even among their you know among the congregation where they feel that you know. Um, you know that they have to, uh, you know, impose that to the congregation that you know we have to, you know, have our own building and you know we have, we need that we need this, we need the support also from, from the congregation. We just wanted to get some uh, get some insights from you on that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's interesting and interesting observations. So uh, I I can share with you our approach to this whole thing about owning our place and so on um see uh, from the beginning um for us uh, uh, there were th three things important and i always put this first first is we want to build people not buildings so that was one of the things i i told even told them, hey when people ask us oh you don't have your own building you don't have your own land i said you know first thing we want to build people not buildings secondly I wanted to, I, I always was thinking, like, see, the moment, of, of, I mean, I'm just sharing, you, sharing with you our thought process. The moment we build a building, it immediately puts a limitation on how much we can grow. And for me, I always, you know, was saying, okay, we want to hit thousands of people, we want to serve thousands of people. So I, I don't want to build a building where 100 people can fit. I would not be satisfied with it. Now, that was easy to do, right? You can buy a place and put up a building a hundred people can fit that but that's not that's not was what was in my heart um, and, and I, I see churches today I see people have you know in our own city you know I see yeah they bought a piece of land they put up a building and what does it do it can hold hundred people it can maybe hold 200 people but that was not the vision that we were carrying for us we wanted to impact thousands we wanted to impact people all around so uh, I didn't want to settle for that because the moment you build something like that it puts a ceiling that okay You'll have 100 people, you have 200 people, but then you can do multiple services, but that also, how much can you do? Right? Uh, the third thing was I never wanted to trouble people with money to build. Right? So that I didn't want that to become the focus, didn't want that to become the distraction. So uh, th this was our philosophy, if you will. This was our thought process from the beginning. Build people. Don't put in limitation uh, with a small building. Uh, and uh, third is don't burden the people uh, with asking for money for building and so on. And so, uh, you know, for a long time, till 2018, that means the first 17 years. I mean, I did speak to, I did speak about, you know, we, you know, we would definitely like to have our own land, and but then we want to have a place that would accommodate the bible college and all of those other all the ministries that are happening so it's going it has to be of a sufficient size and all that i would talk about it but never you know, you know raised funds for it until 2018 which is 17 years after we started right so in 2018 we kind of officially launched our building project more of the bible college that is Let's buy land, let's build our Bible college facility, let's go, you know, formal with it uh, uh, so that we can have hundreds of students come in, we can have students from all over the world come in and train them and so on. So we kind of formally launched it in 2018. Uh, and then, of course, we did the estimate we need at least four acres of land and all those kinds of things. Um, uh, and then, you know, we said, okay, we need so much money to buy the land. Uh, and the interesting thing is all the money came in. So all the money we need to buy the land 
has been sitting with us for some time now. Uh, but we have been looking for the land. Um, and of course, the pandemic came in between. So uh, for two and a half years, uh, the, the search for the land had to slow down a bit. Um, and then and, and then you understand the situation here in India that uh, it's a very messy process, a very complex process of identifying buying the land. So we have to be very careful because uh, this is not personal money, this is church money. So we have to do all the due diligence before. So you know, actually, just to sum it up, uh, our, our building project team they they visited more than a hundred sites, hundred pieces of land not none of them passed uh, right now we are in a stage where we are reviewing one piece of land that means it's going through the legal process um, uh, and if that comes out uh, it's it's about 4.7 acres of land and uh, so far everything looks good uh, in the next one one to two months uh, we will know for sure but the lawyers and everything you know they'll give us their final report and we'll make it uh, and you know it seems like everything is going good, but then the process is going on. Once it's done, if everything goes well, then we will formally announce it that this is the land we're going to buy. Uh, it's for 4.7 acres, almost five acres of land. That's where the Bible College is going to be. That's where the you know we'll have our main uh, church location. All the other church locations will continue, of course. But this whole thing has happened without any stress to the congregation. You know, we just said, look, we're doing this project, there's so much money we need. The money came in first. We haven't even found the land yet. But I, I like it like this, where there is no stress on the uh, on the on the congregation. Nobody felt any problem or that we are asking for money or begging for money, nothing. It was just comfortable. So that's been our approach. Uh, what would I say to, you know, if, if somebody says, you know, if somebody takes a different approach, you no, know, we have to buy land, we have to build, uh, it's up to them, you know, I'm not against it, but I don't like putting pressure on people. Uh, I don't like forcing people to give, I don't like that. Uh, you know, I just feel that when God is in it, he, he will orchestrate things and we don't have to force people to do these things. Um, yes, I understand, you know, what the point you mentioned about it is better to put money into, um, towards an EMI or towards, you know, something like that, but we are doing it without a loan. So we have, you know, there's no EMI involved at all. It's, we have the cash, we'll pay for it in cash, no loan. Uh, we will build the building without any loans. Uh, that's the approach we've decided to take, and that's how it's happening, yeah. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, so that's the you know, pioneering stage. We've had some questions. Let's go forward now. Um, right. So uh, we uh, are now... So from the pioneering stage, you need to transition into the administrative stage. Right? So that means you can imagine it like this. You've laid the foundation, but now the structure has to come up. So example, if you're going to build a five-story building, what do you do? You start raising the pillars you know, that are going to be the main part of your building that's going to support these five stories. Um, and then, you know, the outer structure, the outer shell begins to emerge. But then you are beginning to say that, okay, these are the you know main pillars. This is what the building on top is going to look like. This, you're, you're giving structure to what's going to come up. So um, that's, the second stage, as you're pioneering, you need to put things in place, uh, processes in place that will support the growth. Right? So you define systems and processes. How is everything going to function as a church? 
then you identify your roles and functions for various ministries right in the congregation uh, and I, I'll get into the details I'm just giving you a high level view uh, I'll get into the details and then you also have ways by which new ministries can be birthed you know uh, because you're now ready to start, you're now ready to, you've laid the foundation, you're building on the foundation, of course, and now you're beginning to launch out various ministries that are going to take place through the church that you are pioneering in that place. Right? So you, you kind of say, okay, this is how we're going to launch new ministries. And very important, establish a reproducible model, because we will talk about this a little later, uh, um, that even though you're pioneering a church, hopefully the Lord will lead you to plant more churches, or this church that you pioneer in the future will become a mother church to many other churches. Hopefully. Hopefully that's in, in, in our hearts, that okay, you know, our, our, we shouldn't only think, okay, let's have one church plant, that's enough. No, uh, you know, hopefully in your heart it is like, okay, we can reproduce this. So think always in terms of a reproducible model that you're, you're establishing when you're pioneering a church. So what happens is now as you begin to build, you start thinking about various, so in a service, in your ministry, what are the things, you break things down. Okay, so you'll start thinking about all the teams that need to be in place, like, you know, like right from your greeters, your ushers, your worship team, your, uh, your, your, you know, you may have a team for the children's church, team for the youth. Uh, you may have a team that serves, uh, you, know, you know, hospitality team. So, so many different teams. So you start thinking about those things that need to be in place to make the surface function well uh, you think about during the week like we already spoke about you know prayer teams people who would care for people we call it member care so people who do that part um, people who welcome new visitors so you have a welcome team or a, you know we, we call it a FTV first time visitor team so they meet with the new visitors so different teams and then you assign people. People are put in charge. You give them leadership. You give them responsibility to lead these teams. You know, we just call them team leaders. Uh, you may use different language. It's okay. We just call them team leaders. There are people leading uh, these various ministries that are happening. So some of these things are being set in place. Um, uh, and then how they all be interact with each other, what they do. So these processes are put in place so that, you know, you may have 50 people, you may have 500 people, you may have 5,000 people, but all these teams will function. They just scale up. You know, that means, example, if you have a welcome team that welcomes new people after the service, they, they will function the same way. Whether you have 50 people, 500 people, or 5,000 people, that welcome team is doing the same thing, just that they may scale up. As, as, the, as the number of people coming in scale, go, increases, they just scale up to serve more people. But what they do, like how they welcome people, how they talk to people, how they do that, that process is there. It just increases in size to meet the needs of people. So you put these processes in place uh, to care for, you know, to take care of what's happening. And then you, you stay in tune with God to birth new ministries. Sometimes as a leader, God will give you a vision of what needs to be done. Right? He'll put it into your heart. Sometimes the Lord may send people to you, and then you need to recognize it and say, okay, hey, that's a new ministry. We're going to go with it. For example, you know, uh, um, in our second year, so we're talking about 2002, uh, you know, when we started the church, I, I, I was never thinking about having a children's home. Uh, that was not even in my thought. And uh, given left to myself, I would not have done it. Uh, because for me, 
uh, I felt I didn't want anything to become a distraction. Our children's home is a lot of work, a lot of responsibility, and so on. Uh, but in our second year, in 2002, uh, there was one lady in the church who came and said, can we start a children's home? And, uh, you know, like I said, it was not, it was not even something I was thinking. And I would not have, have done it left to myself. I would just stay with the ministry of the word and, you know, focus on those things. Then uh, I just felt in my heart that, yeah, we can do this. But I told her, I said, see, if you are willing to take responsibility for this and you are willing to lead it, let's go forward. So you take it forward. We will do. We will back it up financially. It'll be a part of the ministry of the church, but you have to take it forward. So she did all her homework, you know, and 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 and, and you know, setting up a children's home is not easy because uh, you have to have, you know, uh, there's the legal side to things, and so on. So she did all that work. She did all that work, and then uh, so eventually, in our second year, 2002, uh, we started a children's home. Uh, we started with about um, I think it was about 12 children, 12 girls, children, children. So we took up a home, we appointed a, a, a warden, you know, for that. And, and, and it's all done by, that, by her. So I was not directly involved other than just discussing, approving things so on. But that was a ministry that was started. Now, as of today, that children's home has been closed uh, because all of them have now you know, grown up, they've gone to college, and uh, and so on. So that's transition. You know, so so we don't have a children's home today because that we 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 journeyed with those twelve girls and took care of them. We didn't grow it beyond that because a lot of responsibility. But I'm just giving an example where that work took place. Then similarly, there was another a few years later, there was another person who came and said, uh, you know, she was involved in dancing, you know, performing arts uh, and dancing and uh, yeah, mainly dancing and choreography and those kind of things. So, you know, she wanted to do that. So, okay, you go ahead and do it. And now this is not something I personally had a vision for, but it was somebody whom God sent. You know, like somebody in the church who came forward with that. It's okay, go ahead with it. And so wonderful things happened. You know, she got people together and um, uh, we did several different productions. Um, some of these videos are online as well. Uh, uh, and they would do, you know, sometimes they would do small choreo uh, performances. Sometimes they would do big things and all that. She trained a lot of people. So a lot of good came. And today she has her own ministry, you know. Uh, today she has, uh, uh, so she, it's 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 no longer part of the church, but she's serving God, and she has her own ministry serving lots of people. But she always comes back, and she's still part of the church. She always comes back and tells you know thank you to me. She says you know thank you for you know this basically like launching that ministry, and today it's it's much bigger and it's doing much more things. Uh, 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 so you know, the point is this. There are times God will give you ideas or visions of what you need to do. There are times God will send people with, uh, you know, these, like I said, a clear vision of what they should do. And, and it would be, you're, 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 you're just a, a person supporting that. You're just encouraging that. You're kind of, you know, giving some guidance and supporting it. And the ministries will be birthed that way. So in both these ways, and new ministries will happen, and you just need to uh, recognize it and move with God. You know, and uh, I'll just share this one thing, one more thing, because this was again something I never thought of. So in our, uh, and, and I think this happened in our first year itself, in 2001. You see, at that time, uh, I had, on, in my mind, I had only thought of was an English congregation. Know, have a congregation with just English, and that's what was all. And because uh, that's the language, I mean, I'm comfortable preaching, ministering that. But in our very first year, unexpectedly, uh, uh, one person came, uh, and he was kind of serving. Uh, he was working actually. He was working, uh, doing some work uh, in my parents' house, and so he came and said, he said. Uh, 
there is a whole community of Nepali people. So Nepali, uh, you know, so people from Nepal who have moved into, of course, they're in India, they've come down into India for work and jobs. So there's this whole big community of Nepali people, like 100,000 people or so in those years. It's grown much more than that now. And they would like to have a church. Would you be willing to start a church for the Nepali people? And he also said, these people work on Saturdays, Sundays. Now, many of them, you know, would uh, were working in uh, restaurants, in uh, you know, they're working as security guards and all different kinds of jobs. So their off day is Tuesday. So can you start a church service for them on Tuesdays? Now, when he came and asked me this, first of all, I never was. I was not thinking about starting. A regional language service in, the, in that, and I never think about not thinking about Nepali people. Never even knew that they were, you know, like uh, I mean, they were in need of a church. I don't speak Nepali, none of it. But I just felt, hey, God is opening a door. I'm going to say yes. So I told him, see, we will do it. I'll come and preach, but you need to organize an interpreter, and we will take care of all the other expenses. We'll do it. So we stepped in, you know. So in our very first year, we started a Nepali service, uh, a service church service for the Nepali people on Tuesdays. Uh, uh, and I think, if I remember correctly, um, I think it was at four p.m. on Tuesdays. And um, and it was so amazing how God provided interpreters, you know, because I was preaching in English, they would interpret. God provided people who would come and do the songs, the worship. And it was just amazing when I look back. And, 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 and people were coming. You know, so we rented a place for them and they would come. And I did that initially, I forget the year now, but I think it must have been till 2005 or six, something like that. So the first five years, I was, I was quote unquote a pastor. But I was—I didn't—I couldn't speak to people. I would just smile at them, love them, you know, speak to the interpreter, whatever I could, a few things. But I—I I, I really couldn't really care for the people because they're different culture, different language. But we were doing this, and God had people there. And I think it was in 2005 or 2006. One person came, and uh, and I just felt like I will hand this off to him. Uh, his name was Timothy. And I said, Timothy, uh, you be the pastor of the Nepali church. You take it forward from here. You know, I've, I've done this, whatever I could, very limited way. Uh, I've done this. Now you've come. Uh, he came all the way from Nepal, from Kathmandu. And uh, he was here in Bangalore. He was looking for a job and all those things. I said, you pastor the church. You take it forward. And so he took it forward. He became the pastor of the Nepali church. Some of their students, some of those young people actually studied in a Bible college. We trained them. So they, you know, it's like pastoral team. I think about at least three of them were studied with us in our Bible college uh, after that. And they were trained. And so the church just took off. You know, and then it grew. Uh, we had more than... Uh, I would still preach from time to time, but he was the pastor and he was preaching all the Sundays and all of that. Uh, I would be like a guest speaker now and then. Uh, the work grew uh, to more than 300 people. And then in 2018, I felt it was time. So they were under, they were part of APC till that time. Then I said, you know, it's time for them to be on their own, you know, um, to have their, to, for them to have full charge, full control of that. So, you know, here, rather than them trying to report to me and all of that, it doesn't make sense. Uh, let them have it all. You know, let them lead it. Let them have full ownership. So in 2018, we released them. He said, you know, you take this forward. Uh, we gave them money initially to, you know, find their own place, to set up their own church, uh, you know, facility, get it all started. I went and did the opening service for them, and they were launched on their own. That was in 2018, and, you know, they've since then uh, continued the work from there. But I share that as an example where it was completely unexpected, but a new ministry was born by the Spirit which blessed hundreds, literally hundreds, maybe it, maybe I could say maybe even in thousands because they keep coming and going. Uh, 
uh, you know, lives have been blessed. Uh, it was something unplanned. It wasn't something I thought of. It was just a door that God opened, we recognized and moved in. So new ministries are being birthed. And um, God will birth it by giving you a vision. He may birth it by sending people to you. You need to recognize and you need to move with it and uh, let those ministries happen. Okay, uh, I know I've talked a lot here. There, there's some more things I want to say here about this uh, reproducible model. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, let me pause here. We have a few minutes um, to take any questions. Any questions so far? We're talking about the, you know, the the structural stage. So while you're pioneering, you're, you're birthing new ministries and how to do that. Any questions? Everybody's good? Okay. So we will um, continue this tomorrow. I'll just share a few more thoughts there on stage two. and. Um, and then from there we'll, we'll go forward. Okay. All right. May I request somebody to please close in prayer, and uh, we will dismiss after that. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you. Blessed to be your holy name, Father, for who you are and who you've become and who you're going to be. Thank you for the words, oh God, that we've heard. And thank you for your servant whom you've used, oh God, to speak to us this morning. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will give us the grace, oh God, to do that which pleases God and not man. Mm. I pray, Lord, that even as we embark on this journey, oh God, to serving you in truth and in spirit you will give us the grace the enablement the wisdom the knowledge the understanding to walk according to your will and not according to our flesh mm. or according to the wisdom of this word we pray father that you give us this spirit of consistency the spirit of focus just as we've heard this morning the the need for us to stay focused on that which you have called us on i pray lord that you will help us Help us, O God, not just to be men, O God, who just want to do God's work, but men who are devoted to seeing your kingdom expand. Father, we pray that you will also give us the mind, O God, to expand that which you have given to us to others. The Father, O God Almighty, the wings, O God, will spread out and be, O God, a wings, O God, for other people to flourish in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Son. Thank you, Holy Spirit of God. For we know that the words we've heard today will not just drop void, but it will impact us and will go forward to see your kingdom expand. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. I'll uh, see you all tomorrow. Have a good afternoon, good day. God thank bless. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh.